Good morning all. Um, I was watching an old TV programme about two or three days ago. It was an old rerun of Time Team, um, which is always used to be one of my favourite programmes. And it was the one with Caster Church, where they dug it up looking for Roman bits and bobs. And I thought, Caster, Caster. Not, not thought of doing a walk at Caster. So um, here we are, I'm heading for Caster. Um, one of the things I learned from that programme was they all called it Caster. Uh, I've always called it Caster, but it seems everybody that appeared on that programme referred to it as Caster. So whether it's Caster or whether it's Caster, that's, that's where we're heading. I know a bit about the village uh, uh, and I've, I've picked up a bit of research in the last couple of days, so hopefully there'll be something of, of interest there. But yeah, that's where we're heading. We're heading down we're towards Love Hill at the moment uh, to enter Caster village. That's something else I've learnt already. I always thought it's called Love Hill. It's Love's Hill. There you go. Back in my cycling days, I used to hate coming up this hill. You know, and I was gasping my last breath and I'd look to my side and I'd see that sign saying Love's Hill. And I used to think, what an inappropriate name for a hill. Hell's Hill maybe, but not Love's Hill. Um, it's, a, it's a hell of a hill if you're a cyclist, but you'll know that already. I think that's a gateway to Caster House, of which I know very little. Um, that's quite posh. Well, at least the gateway does. Can't see anything in there. Amazing how many vehicles go up and down into this village. It used to be a lot more when this was the A47. We used to drive through it quite a bit before the uh, current A47 was open, but it's still busy. If I've got this right, although it's being used as a milestone now, I think that stone is the base of an old medieval cross. Um, it's certainly marked on the maps as being in this vicinity, so I'm going to gamble that that's not actually a milestone. Um, I might be wrong, but there's a medieval cross base somewhere around here and I can't find it. So I'm going to assume that is it. Looks like it's been moved, to be honest with you. but. Uh, I'm going to grab this. Right, got my bearings now. That is a caster house. Um, dates back to the 1700s. It used to be the house for the, uh, or, or where the bishops of Peterborough used to live um, for 200 years, up to the early 1900s. The strange things when I was reading up, or the strange thing when I was reading this up, um, a couple of days ago is that the, the two pillars at the front and the, and the gates at the front and all the railings uh, date to the 1600s, which is earlier than the house, so not quite sure how that works. And the thatched house on the left there is Dragon House, which used to be the Georgian Dragon pub, built in the early 1700s as a pub, closed in 1929. Um, when we get past it, I'll put up a picture from about 100 years ago when it was still a pub. And you can see how it compares. Dragon House. That's how it looks today. Apart from the sun blocks your view. That's an early 1800s uh, stone barn. Ba 
happening with the cars this morning. Uh, note the vertical ventilation slits that we saw in Orton Waterville. They have their own version of those in this village, as you'll see in a mo. Triangular ventilation holes. That's actually a 1600s barn conversion. I don't know why they're triangular, but we'll see those again later on the walk. I think I prefer those. Got a date stone on the top of that one. This is always most welcome. 18. 76 or 5, 1876 I think it says. That's an old 1600s, 1700s house and that low section right in front of us with a lower roof used to be a brew house. It's a brew their own ale here. That's an early 1700s house with a Welsh slate roof unusually. Very nice that. We've got, uh, well, it used to be three cottages, and it's now one super cottage. It's a big one. I say it used to be three. Sixty nine stamped on that one. The Royal Oak dates back to early seventeen hundreds. I know there'd be a date somewhere on the Royal Oak, 1727. Across from the Royal Oak, that's an early 1700s house with a sort of outbuilding that's been bolted on and converted. There's an old 1600s cottage, it's another one of those that well, I'd say it's probably three cottages into one. If it isn't three into one, it's two into one. It certainly wasn't this one big cottage back in the 1600s. It seems like 90% of the buildings in uh, Castor are former farm buildings. There were several farms down here. They're all converted barns of one sort or another, dating from 1600s through to late 1800s. Um, nicely done keeps the character. It's better than demolishing them and just putting new builds in. Just coming up to the village hall or the current village hall, uh, but it used to be the school. It used to be known as Castor Fitzwilliam School. Uh, it was built by the fifth Earl Fitzwilliam, known as Charles William. Uh, so it was built in 1829, closed in 1954, and it just crossed the road, basically and merged with the other Castor school, which was like the infant school. Uh, there is now just the one school here. And uh, all the pupils go there, but this used to be um, Castor Fitzwilliam School, as it was referred to. The 
Well, there's a date on it anyway, but I'm pretty sure it was 1829, if I recall. Spot on, 1829. Just coming up to the second pub in Castor, Fitzwilliam Arms. Well, it used to be a pub. I'm not 100% sure what it is anymore. I think it's more a restaurant than a pub, but it's still here. And it's an old 1600s building, albeit very significantly uh, modified since, but it looks old. Not sure if it's called the Fitzwilliam Arms or the Chubby Caster. Prefer the Fitzwilliam Arms, I must admit. Lovely building though. We had the old blacksmiths. Uh, it goes back to early 1600s, or at least the left part of it with the sloping roof, which probably was the smithy. The bit sticking out towards the road was about 80 years more recent. I think that went to the sort of late 1600s, but the, uh, the part we're pointing out now is the original smithy. Very nice. date stamp on this, it probably will be late 1600s. Um, spot on. Castor pub number three, the Prince of Wales Feathers, probably my favourite. Been in there a few times recently. Uh, dates back to early 1800s. Most of it does anyway. The bit that doesn't date back to 1800 is the red bricked section on the left, which used to be a standalone cottage, which dated back about 100 years before the pub, so 1700s, and it was just a cottage, uh, is now part of the pub. Lovely old house to the right here, it dates back to 1700s, but it's got bits in it that go back to 1500. Um, there's a window somewhere that has been dated in the 1500s, so it's a bits and bobs type house, but an old one for sure. Dura Brivier, named after the Roman settlement nearby. Just coming up onto the old village green. Uh, the wall at the back there used to be, I mean, it, it was one side of a bunch of uh, farm buildings from nearby Manor Farm. It's like they've took the buildings down but left the walls up at the back. They're pretty old walls as well. This is the cross on the village green, a farmer's cross it's called now. It's all been done up with a new cross on the top. Uh, the bit of interest to me is this uh, square bit at the bottom, which is the base of and a stump above it of an old medieval cross that was here. Um, so anything from 600 years to a thousand years ago, um, that's all that remains of it. Just that base and the bottom of the stump of the cross. And it's been lifted and embedded into a new cross now, which is good. Should see it survive. This is an old 1910 photograph of a shop. I think it was a grocery and drapery shop that sat on the corner here. And it's 
There's the shop as it is today. Still noticeable as a former shop with those windows. The other building of interest down here is the uh, Castor Congregational Chapel as was built in 1848. Um, it closed in the 1970s and then reopened as the sort of admin centre and offices of uh, Hall's Chemists. So I was told there was also a shop here in the building for a short period of time. But it's been Hall's for quite some time now. And it doesn't quite look like a, some of the chapels we've seen. That's because it's got an extension on the right that was added later on. If you take that away, it looks like every other sort of chapel. Castor Congregational Chapel. Always lots of back roads at Castor, full of uh, old buildings. You can easily get lost here, where well, you can't, but uh, yeah, it's worth meandering off the beaten track. Skirting around the sort of top end of the church now, uh, to this church wall which I think I'm right in saying is Grade 2 listed, again. Um, and the thing that always fascinates me about these walls are the stones, the capping stones on the top, because apparently most of them are coffin lids, or pieces of coffin lids. I'm not sure how that works. I'm going to have to do some research. I mean, some of the stones are flat and I suspect these are just pieces of stone. Then you get these that clearly are not flat. I mean that is clearly a coffin lid. It's even got some faint engraving on it. Yeah, I'm going to have to research how coffin lids end up being used for walls. I mean, these are definitely coffin lids. Definitely. That one is called Stonely, with the thatch. And the 1700s house, looking mighty fine. Have a quick wander up High Street. This is the most inappropriate name in the modern era for a quiet road. Very nice. And I'm just wandering up here, there's four, there's four sort of thatches, or four houses, I don't think they're all thatches. Four old houses at the top end that are all sort of 1700s and one that's slightly older. And the stone building on the right is a 1700s house. as I believe are the two on the left. The stone one here and then the thatch after it. But the old one is the one on the right in the distance. I'll perhaps walk past it and come back. That's a 1600s house that is. I see the one on the left looks just as old but I'm assured it's not. Hundreds just seems a ridiculously long time ago. You cannot imagine what's walked past here over the years. I 
the church of St Kineburger in the distance Right, we're entering serious history um, land now when it comes to uh, Castor, which is the, around the church. But you know, this was a big, all around here was a big Roman area. You used to have the big settlement of Dura Brivia, which was a really big um, Roman settlement down by the river. Um, and you had all the pottery area. It was a big industrial area in terms of pottery making. Uh, but around the church here, there used to be a big Roman building. Some have called it a villa, but it's not a villa. It's some sort of big, a regional center of some sort. Nobody really knows. It was given the name of Praetorium uh, by a, an architect in the in the 1800s, um, which doesn't really have a strict meaning apart from mighty big Roman building. And we're kind of sitting on it at the moment. It goes across the churchyard, but also uh, to where we are now um, on, on this road that runs up steeply alongside the church. So uh, there is some evidence of the Praetorium. Uh, but most of it's underground and uh, a lot of it was sort of dug up in the 1800s by this um, uh, archaeologist and it was dug up again by Time Team. Uh, I'll put a link at the bottom of this video to the Time Team episode. It's well worth watching and they'll tell you a lot more than I can tell you, but uh, it'll, it'll give you a better perspective of the Roman influence on this area of Castor. But we're going to disappear into the churchyard in a moment, but I'm actually sitting next to um, a piece of the pra Praetorium, um, a wall. Um, that was believed to run around the edge of it. I mean, it was just big. It covered most of the land around here, and this is a chunk of it. Um, it's one of the walls. There's two sections, actually. I'll wander down to the other one in a minute that stick out the side of this roadside wall. Um, doesn't exactly blend in, um, but this is Roman. Pretty old stuff. About 1,800 years ago, somewhere in that region, plus or minus 100 years. Never, seen, never, never sat next to a Roman wall before. That's one piece of the wall. There's another one down here. This has got a sign above it as well. Uh, it's a sort of herringbone design, which is classic uh, Roman walling design. They used to, uh, well, you can see, they would line stones going that way and then on the layer beneath it would go the other way and then so on all the way down. Herringbone. You know what a herringbone looks like. About 230 AD. And it's believed this wall would probably, looking at it, have headed in that direction. So towards the back of the church. It's believed this praetorium exists mostly at the back of the church. St. Kineburger. having a much needed break in the churchyard. Um, when I was doing the, the sort of research for this one and started getting into what this church was about, I mean, it was Orton Hall all over again. Uh, it's so much detail. You've got to go and, uh, you know, if you really want to know about this church, then uh, uh, go and search it on Google. There's plenty of good websites. I mean, Kineburger was a seventh century, I believe it was, saint. Um, so you're talking about uh, just after the Romans, basically. And uh, she has all sorts of intricate connections with, with the Peterborough Cathedral. And, and um, in a small or some might say significant way, she's part of the formation of Peterborough as we know it today, in terms of her family, in terms of her father, who was a, um, a, a Mercian king. And uh, it, it, she's very much in, intertwined with the whole sort of birth of Peterborough. So it's well worth reading up, but I'm not going to attempt to do it because it is quite... It is quite a complex subject, but it was about the seventh century, and um, and uh, St. Kineburger, if I can call her that, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. It just <laughs> it sounds a bit fast food to me, but uh, St. Kineburger um, in the Castor area, right where we are now, where the church is now, she built something. Uh, it's described uh, as a nunnery, as a monastery, um, as an abbey. Um, I don't know what it was. It's some sort of religious um, base on the site of this church. And uh, it was destroyed by the Vikings 
uh, when they came over. So it wasn't here for too long, but she put her stamp here. Um, it was demolished by the Vikings and then rebuilt by the Normans in the sort of 1100s. And uh, it's believed that the church, as it is today, is, is sort of made up of bits and bobs, really, as most churches are. But it's also literally made up of bits and bobs that survived from both the Roman um, period when the Praetorium was here uh, and also from St. Kineberger's building, uh, whatever it was, Abbey, Nunnery, whatever. And there's little bits uh, of both of those sort of intertwined within today's church. So it's a right mixed bag uh, of great interest. And uh, I think I mentioned earlier, watch the Time Team video because they'll describe it far better than I have and bring it uh, uh, to life for you. But we'll have a wander around. I could pick out a few bits that will make sense and I'll just show you the church because it is a fantastic church. It's, it's been described by uh, a number of uh, top historians um, as one of the finest, if not the finest Norman church in this country. So it's well worth having a good look at. Uh, I meant to mention that St. Kineberger was buried in the church, the building, uh, the abbey, the nunnery, whatever you call it. Um, she was actually buried in her own building, but her body was removed um, in the in the 900s, I think it's 970 something, something around 970 AD. Uh, her body was removed from here and uh, put into uh, Peterborough Cathedral. So um, if you're a Peterborough Cathedral goer, she's in there somewhere worth uh, checking her out. I'm, I must go and have a look myself. I don't think I've ever seen a churchyard with so many graves in it. And I'm told there's just as many under the ground. Um, you know, they literally used to remove bodies, chuck them in a pit, as it were. So they had room to build more sort of higher level graves so they could keep burying people. Um, be incredible to see a list of who's buried here. Not just the ones we could see, but those that were buried here, you know, hundreds of years ago. You'll see on the Time Team video if you watch it, you know, as they dug down, they just found bodies uh, everywhere. This is the grave of Edmund Tyrrell Artis, who was the guy in the 1800s that dug this place up basically and exposed the praetorium as he called it that was underneath or the elements of it that he could find i'll put some pictures up he, he was a fantastic artist as well as archaeologist or enthusiastic archaeologist and he, he put some fantastic pieces of artwork together i'll put some of these up and you can see what he found Edmund Tyrrell artist who died 24th of December, Christmas Eve, 1847. Certainly left his mark. It's amazing how there's just gravestones everywhere, propping up against walls. I mean, I guess nobody knows where they're supposed to go. Amazing. Fantastic old gravestone just standing at the side of the churchyard. Um, John Rapperson. I can't see that date. 1650, 1850, 
I'm trying to interrogate this at home back on the computer and see if I can uh, find something out about this guy. If he deserves more than just being left against uh, a stone wall. William Bate, late of Warrington Esquire. If I can find something out about this chap, I'll put it at the bottom of the screen. It's the Norman Tower at the top of this one that really stands out. I mean, it's just so ornate. The amount of work that's gone into that tower. Pretty stunning, really. The church itself dates to 1124. It's a Norman church. Um, prior to that, it was um, St. Kinderberg's Abbey Nunnery, whatever, and prior to that it was the Roman Praetorium. Um, so it's a sort of third stage building on this site. And there's elements in here that date back. There's bits and pieces that have obviously been salvaged from the previous buildings and built into this one. I'll go and have a quick, I can see one or two bits I'm pretty sure, date back to something pre-Norman. Up above the main door is that, which I think I read somewhere it is believed to be Anglo-Saxon and therefore that will have been salvaged from the previous building here. So somewhere between, I don't know, 500 AD and, the, and, and 1000 AD I guess, that sort of time period and it's been sort of embedded in the Norman church. Not sure what that is or who that is, um, but the, the two circles of the sun and the moon. No idea what that was. Yeah, interesting. I've seen these uh, reddish elements in the wall that look like tiles. Uh, the old Roman praetorium that was here had a red tiled roof. So this is me talking here, not historians, but I wouldn't mind betting that these tiles have survived from the Roman building. Could be completely wrong but the colour is quite distinct. And they feature throughout this wall. It just seems a bit random to put them in there if you were building this from stone and stone only. There's certainly tiles. I don't think the statue is necessarily that old. I would suggest what's above the statue is. And I read somewhere that that actually does say 1160 something. Fantastic stonework on that tower. It really is top class. brave man who put that cockle on the top was. 
not for me. Seventh century Saxon cross made from a third century Roman altar and moved into the church. That's a shame. Would like to have seen that. I'd like to just come back to this lady because, uh, <laughs> believe it or not, when I was filming this a few seconds ago, a chap came along and said, My son did that. Not the piece above, which I'm sure he's Anglo Saxon, but. Uh, yeah, this chap's son carved um, that stone lady about 11 years ago. Very clever lad, that. A bit of a coincidence, though, as he walked past while I was filming it. Got more of these sort of red tiles. I'm sure they're tiles. They're not bricks, they're tiles. I'm going to stick my neck out and say they are roof tiles from the old Roman building that was here. I'm sure there'll be archaeologists laughing their socks off at that one, but I'm going with it. Like a graveyard for gravestones. Very strange. Frederick Pohl died in 1921. Only 47 years old. It's a military grave. Died during the war, at the end of the war. George. Edwin Holmes, maybe, schoolmaster of Castor, for 25 years, died in 1911. It's a lovely cottage with a date stone of 1803 on it. Very nice. Must be spring. We have all Brescia. Good to see. We just remember driving along the old A47, which is this, and seeing these houses and uh, thinking, yeah, maybe one day. I mean, that's a Desiree's. And another one. Castor Heights. We're back down near um, Milton Ferry now. And these two stones, there's one there. I'll uh, just pan across. There's another one there. Now these are known as Little John and Robin Hood stones and there's all sorts of myths surrounding these in theory if you believe the myth uh, they are either markers for um, an arrow that was shot by Robin Hood and Little John or they were stones that were here anyway that just happened to be hit by arrows shot by Robin Hood and Little John and the legend has it they fired their arrows from right over there on the other side of that lake somewhere near Old Walton which obviously is bananas, like most myths are. Um, what these actually were, if I just switch my camera lens, 
That's better. Now you can see them both in shot. Um, they're markers, they're track markers. Uh, and the reason they're here is there used to be a track that ran straight down from here to the river bank. And it was, it was solely for the purpose of conveying stone from Barnet Quarry, what we now know as hills and holes or hills and hollows. And it conveyed that stone, horse and cart wise, down a track straight in front of us to the river for travelling by barge down to Peterborough Cathedral, Ely Cathedral, Bury St Edmunds Cathedral for the construction of those cathedrals. Um, the, the church, the bishop, the cathedral, the, the officials in town owned Barnet Quarry um, and they wanted their stone to travel toll free because uh, this was Milton Estate lands and just down where Milton Ferry Bridge is now is where Gunwade Ferry used to be and that was a toll ferry. So there's no way that the, uh, the powers that be in Peterborough wanted to pay to have their stone um, moved every time it turned up here. So they obviously did some sort of deal and they had their own track here. And these two stones are merely here to mark where the track was. It ran straight between the two. So they're track markers. Uh, there's no Robin Hood, no Little John, but you can keep the myth alive. Good for the tourists. Right, we're nearly done with Castle. There is one site I've still got to do, and it's across the other side of the village, and my legs are aching, so I'm not going to trek all the way back. I'm going to teleport. So I'll see you in a moment. Welcome back. Uh, where are we? Well, we're on a railway line. Uh, let me turn the camera around a second. This is the site of Castor Railway Station. It's actually quite a distance from Castor. It's nearer to Aylesworth, but it was called Castor. So we're going to include it. And uh, I'll put a, put a couple of pictures up uh, for more or less where I am now. As you can see, there was a platform on the right and the left, a uh, station house on the left. Um, so it's quite a substantial substantial minor railway station. I mean, all stations seemingly in, back in the uh, 1800s were built with uh, substance, as it were. But yeah, this is, this is where it is today. Same site, there's nothing here, apart from the crossing. Just to the right of that silver tree, and you could probably just make out some wire fencing in amongst the shrubbery there. Just behind it was the car park to the station. Um, I mean the key key numbers for this one. Uh, it, it opened when the, when the railway line opened, so 1845 ish, um, and it carried on until well, it was close to passengers. Are they all close to passengers first? Uh, close to passengers in 1957, and close to freight in 1964, and the line closed a couple of years after that. Um, there's always people then pop up at this stage and say, oh no, there were still trains after that. You know, there might have been. I don't know, freight, iron ore trains or something, but it was in effect completely closed um, in 1964, just before the line closed. On the uh, early evening of uh, 3rd of January 1945, quite close to the end of the Second World War, um, there was a, a V1 rocket. In case you don't know what they look like, I'll put one on the screen. A V1 rocket uh, landed while they were trying to shoot down Castor Railway Station is beyond me. But yeah, a V1 rocket landed very close to the station. In fact, it did cause damage to the building here uh, or the buildings here. Um, so it's a sort of claim to fame. There weren't many places in Peterborough. In fact, I don't think there were any that were hit by a V1. Um, but it was believed it was probably launched from an aircraft because it was all the sort of ground launch V1s by then were just impossible. I mean, they just didn't, they didn't own the land. We'd moved in, as it were, into Europe. So it was believed it was launched from an aircraft. As I say, why, I don't know. Uh, but it did some damage. I used to know somebody who knew exactly where it landed because he said there was a huge crater, but unfortunately he's passed away and, and I've lost all my records. So I don't know where it is. I, I have a suspicion, if you can see this, but I have a suspicion it's just off the side here, full of water now. Um, you know, it probably was in this sort of area, but I can't prove that. Uh, if you do know where it landed, I'd be, I'd be interested to know, because I've often wondered when I've walked through this area where that crater is. 
there's several possible sites but I think it's to the left of us now somewhere there's quite a few holes there full of water We're just looking out from the crossing now towards where the station was and more to the point directly in front of us was where the station master's house was which you can just see in the corner of those old photographs. It was believed that uh, the station master during the 1940s, during the time of the war, um, was a keen gardener and he didn't have a lot of room to sort of grow flowers alongside this building so he grabbed a bit of land behind the station and created his own little bit of paradise, I suppose. Uh, he had an orchard in there, uh, he had flower beds in there, he even had pigs in there at one point in time. Had his own little bit of land. The station master's garden, and it's being restored, or it has been restored recently, as the station master's garden, uh, to remember it and to remember him. Let's wander down and have a look. Like the remains of a building there, not sure what that is. Um, looks like there was a, a hut or something. Let's clamber up. Yeah, we're on the foundations of something. No idea. Just have to look that up, see if I can find something. Next to the stream. No idea. It's nicely done anyway. It's in its infancy. This is going to mature. Things are going to grow. And uh, yeah, good work from the people at uh, Neen Park, I think, who are doing this with some sort of charity grant. I do recall reading somewhere at some time that in the middle of this garden, so called, was an old railway carriage and actually somebody lived here whether it was a family a person i don't know um, i'm intrigued about that one i'll have to see if i can find anything out i'm not even sure where i could go to look um, but i'm assured some research was done and yeah there was it was a sort of uh, it was a residence in an old carriage it's a pity it's not still here and i don't know when that was but i'll try and find out I mentioned when we were up by the church, this whole area around Castor is, uh, is uh, big on Roman remains, as it were. I say remains, it was a big Roman site. Uh, I mean, across the other side to the railway, uh, other side of the railway, sorry, to where I am at the moment, you had the big settlement of the Dura Brivier, um, which was of some significance. It was quite a mighty town, if you want to call it that. But I mean, it was not a small Roman settlement. It was. Uh, it was uh, something of some size and importance. Um, but over this side, on the Castor side of the railway, was a more industrial area. Uh, and where I'm walking now is Norman Gate Field. Uh, Norman Gate Field was where all the pottery works were. I mean, this area was huge for pottery. I mean, Castor ware, Castor pottery, Castor Roman pottery has been found all over the world, even over in Rome itself. Um, it travelled the world, it was, it, it, was, it was in demand, it was quality stuff um, and that pottery was created here under my feet and across this field and I always make it a challenge of mine when I walk through here um, to find some Roman pottery lying around on the ground so I'm going to have another go I am not 100% confident because it's all grassed over you're better off when it's just been ploughed but I'm going to have a quick look uh, I usually find something, so I'm going to see if I can find some castaway pottery, Roman pottery, sorry, about 2,000 years old, just short of 2,000 years ago. 
It's always tricky this time of year when you've got grass on the field and it hasn't been ploughed yet uh, to spot things lying on the surface, but it's castaway pottery is usually grey in colour, it usually has a grey glaze to it, which doesn't help you find it, I suppose. We will find something. Oh, I'm not going home. There you go, there's something down there, it looks interesting. Indeed, that is a bit of Roman pottery down there. Centre screen. Let's have a look. Yeah. There you go. You've got the grey glaze on there. On both sides, in fact. Nearly 2,000 years old. There's another piece down there, I can see. A little bit of glaze on it. It's worn off that side. Yep. More grey Roman castaway pottery. I'm no Roman pottery expert. I don't know what that is, but it looks man-made. So it could be Roman, no idea. I know some of you will be thinking oh, it's just a piece of stone, but it's not. It's the top of a pot, beaker, something like that. That's the sort of rim. You can see it's slightly going round. Um, yeah, I'm 99% sure that's a piece of pottery. Right, the weather's closing in a wee bit. I know the sun's still out, but it's getting a bit grey around here. So, uh, having found my Roman pottery, I'm quite happy now, and I'll call it a day. Uh, as ever, uh, I do hope you found something of uh, interest in Castor. Fully appreciate that I didn't cover Aylesworth, but I think Aylesworth deserves a video in its own right, so I will do that uh, at some point. Uh, so yeah, I hope you enjoyed something. If there's anything you thought, well, you got that wrong, or I can clarify that, or I can tell him the actual reality rather than what he told us. Yeah, do please drop a comment below the video if you're on YouTube. Uh, if you're on the, the Peterborough Images Facebook group, then just, just put your comments on there. I, I always appreciate feedback of any sort whatsoever, and I'm learning all the time, so I'm no historian. So yeah, if you can uh, enlighten me, then, then please go ahead and do so. And, uh, yeah, I don't know when I'm out next, but I will see you again, and thank you for watching. Thank you.